Okay, you win. I'll tell you. She removed my socks. <laughs> I just like them. Just like that. Just like that. She threw them on the floor. <laughs> Can you believe that? And then she started kissing me. That's not important. She threw the socks. <laughs> set me free, but without the truth takes something. It takes presence and courage. Reflect on your life and find one area where you are not done. landmarks representing the leading locations. Worldwide, we hear the state. Welcome to Security Chamber G110. What is your request? You need a need a need a need a need a message. Logging on. Hang on a minute, honey. Connection made. Well, thank you so much. That is normal. The levels of energy, the sound, increased tremendously to such a level that I came very close to panic. Yeah! And 
suddenly it just stopped. I'll start from the beginning. Okay. Real slow. Ready? Yeah. All right. Are we ready? We're ready. <laughs> All right. There we go. One, two, one, two, three, four. Okay, Russian boys. Strabuji. Strabuji. Russian boys. Okay, I have to say. Yeah. 
Excuse me, we are recording here. This is Amarik. So in Amarik, when you say I love you to someone, you say this. You be quiet. Buta me eva de shalhu. Very romantic, right? <laughs> okay. But I'm the one to shalhu. It sounds better when you do it.
most wonderful, the most interesting, the most talented, and the most extraordinary being in the whole universe. You have a unique gift to contribute. young people from 10 different continents see their faces from Africa, South America, Europe, Middle East, Asia, New discoveries have overturned 150 years of scientific thinking when it comes to us, to you and me, and the way we think about ourselves, about one another, about the world, from undeniable evidence of advanced civilizations that are now dating back in the last ice age and even before, to the way we think about other people and their cultures, their religions, their beliefs, and even the way we view disease and immortality, there is a new story that's emerging. My name is Greg Braden, and I'd like to welcome you to this very special presentation of Missing Links, the deep truth of our origin, history, destiny, and fate. So here's my question to you. How can we be resilient in a world that's growing more volatile by the day? How can we thrive in the new normal that's already with us, it's already here, unless we're honest with ourselves about that story and what it's showing us?
As difficult as it was for me, I have come to an inescapable and profoundly disturbing conclusion. I believe that an elite group of people and the corporations they run have gained control over not just our energy, food supply, education, and health care, but over virtually every aspect of our lives. And they do it by controlling the world of finance, not by creating more value, but by actually controlling the source of money. When I followed the money, I found that it took me up the levels of a pyramid. Here we are at the bottom level going about our daily lives. Above us is government, people who are given a monopoly on force and use it to tax and control us whether or not we agree. But who controls them? At the next level are the corporations. Many would say that it is now corporations and not nation states that rule the world. They call it a corporatocracy. To acquire the world's resources and control the markets, this corporatocracy must have access to cheap money. The big corporations get their loans at special rates from the big banks, which means that those who control the major banks, the money to elite, ultimately control the corporations. As I've followed the money, I've learned that almost everything I once believed about money is simply not true. How do you keep something secret? You hide it in plain sight. There were bodies that were involved with some of these crashes, also some were alive. I said, well, you're going to tell the public about it. And he says, no, we don't tell the public about this. It would uh, panic the public. And you know, there's a new name. It's unexplained aerial phenomenon. I'm a doctor in an ER taking care of shootings and stabbings and car wrecks. And I'm being asked to brief the CIA director on stuff because he and the president are being lied to? What? And he said, by the way, we've discovered a base on the backside of the moon. And I said, I said, who's? <laughs> If the average person knew that the term UFO was actually concocted after they knew that they were extraterrestrial vehicles or man-made anti-gravity devices, they would realize that for 60 years we've already had the solution to the environmental crisis, the energy crisis, and global poverty. The most dangerous thing going on on the planet today isn't ISIS, it's not Iraq, it's not Russia. It's not China. It's a out of control, covert group that is not being overseen by the people, the Congress, or the president who have developed these technologies and are recklessly using them to track and target extraterrestrial vehicles. The result of this is that we're in a crisis that is unacknowledged, ironically, because these projects are unacknowledged. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. There is no threat, and we have to prevent the weaponization of space. So either they don't exist, but if they are, they're a threat. So this is the one-two punch that's been going on, unfortunately, for 60-some years. He said, do you know why they killed Marilyn? Mr. President, the late Marilyn Monroe. And I said, well, I didn't until I got this document. It's a, a virtual death warrant. When they found out that Tesla had passed away, they came in, they had the manager of the hotel open the safe, and they took all of Tesla's papers. Now, a lot of people say, oh, well, that's an urban myth or a conspiracy theory. I say, like the hell it is. This is like a bad, you know, conspiracy novel, except this became my life.
And this is by far the most cutting statement made in recent times, Thomas Jefferson, because this is what we find ourselves in today. I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties and standing armies. If the American people ever allow private banks, remember all our banks in the world, are virtu virtually all the banks are private banks, private corporations, whose interest is making profit at all costs. So if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and the corporations that will grow up around the the banks will drive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. That's where we are standing today. All over the world, this is the situation we're in. Money is the obstacle to all progress. It does nothing for society. It is the absolute tool of control by those that control the issue and the printing of money. That's why when I say they own the world, they do. They literally, physically own the world in each of one of our asses. It prevents the natural flow of free energy, and that is very important to this weekend's activities here. Money prevents the natural flow of free energy, so I beg you, everyone present here, remember it's about free energy, not I'm going to make a billion dollars out of this energy. Give it away for free. It'll come back to you in ways you cannot imagine. Do that one thing for humanity. If you find any source of free energy, don't try and make zillions out of it. It will kill you or they will kill you before you can get it out there. Money is the primary cause for the seven deadly sins. We all know the seven deadly sins, or have we forgotten them already? It's not the love of money. Many people ask, oh, it's just the love of money. Money is nothing wrong with money, man. It's just a form of exchange. You know, we're so poisoned that we, we, try, and, we try and argue for, for it. We try and defend it. That's how poisoned our minds have become. It's incredible. It's not the love of money. It's the mere presence of money that causes all these problems. If you take money out of the system, all this stuff suddenly and miraculously vanishes. So what is the solution? If it's the mere presence of money or the love of money of all of the above, what are we going to do to solve the problem? The answer is so blatantly obvious. Remove money. Just get rid of it. Get rid of it. What do we need it for? It's causing all the strife in our lives. It's destroying our planet. The mines are raping our mother earth, taking out the precious guts out of our Gaia and distributing it around the world to people that claim they own it. It's sick. The obvious questions, if you remove money, so who's going to shovel the crap? How are we going to pay for things? I'll just sit on my ass and do nothing. I want 50 Ferraris. You know... Are we going back to the dark ages, living in caves? Is this a lawless society? Who's going to make the rules? Why should I do something I don't want? These are the first things. I know these are the most commonly asked questions, and I'm sure that you're asking some of them to yourselves. But um, I can tell you that as you work through this process of a moneyless society, a Ubuntu society where everybody contributes their natural talents or acquired skills to the greatest benefit of all with certain minor rules that are not rules, it's really just an agreement that this is how we're going to work together. The moment you start working in that kind of community, the abundance is so spectacular that we, right now, cannot imagine it. It is not possible for us to imagine it until you start immersing yourself in this kind of thinking. And I call these the Ubuntu communities, as I said, where everyone contributes their natural talents or acquired skills for the greater benefit of all in the community. A new social structure for a new world and a new age. Abundance for all beyond our wildest belief. There are five mantras, five key points to the Ubuntu society, and it's not barter or trade. Everybody often jumps, a lot of people jump to the, to the conclusion, think, oh, let's go back to barter. No. He who has more to barter or trade will eventually rule the roost. So you can't go to that system. If you have nothing to trade, what are you going to say? Well, I've got nothing to trade, so I'll have to, you know, kiss your butt. No. So, the Ubuntu contribution mantra is, the five points, no money, no barter, no trade, no value attached to anything greater or lesser than anything else, because why? Each one of our contributions should be and is equally valuable. If you start telling, well, I'm a doctor, my time is more valuable than yours, you're barking up the wrong tree, brother. Okay, so... And the final one, where everyone contributes for the greater benefit of all in the community, because that is how you get rewarded. 
You get rewarded by the recognition of the people in your community. Isn't that the highest reward everybody wants and is trying to buy with money is recognition and respect of others? In essence, ultimately, that's what most people really want is just to be loved and recognized for what they've done. And they think they can use money to do that. And then when they make a lot, a lot of money, they get zillions in the bank. Then they suddenly realize, oh, well, nobody loves me anymore. They all want to take my money. So let me spend my money and then people will love me. And that's generally what happens when they start paying for things and people love them more. When they start giving it away. <laughs> so united Ubuntu communities. In unity we thrive and anything is possible. Anything is possible. A world without money. There's no crime, no envy, no gluttony, no greed, no hoarding, no hierarchy. And the whole Ubuntu, the Ubuntu movement and the Ubuntu party has no hierarchy. Communities look after themselves. We have no central government. We don't have any central assholes trying to tell you how you should be running your life. No obstacles to any kind of progress because the solutions are simple and there are many bright minds here. We all know what the solutions are, what should be done to solve the problems, and somehow our politicians just can't get it right. They just they keep screwing it up, you know? So don't ask the politicians to solve it. Give it to the scientists, give it to the farmers, give it to the engineers. They'll solve the problems for us. Ordinary people will. Politicians will do nothing. Transition will have to occur in simple steps that flow from one to the other. We can't go from zero to hero. We can't go from a moneyless, driven, capitalistic, consumeristic monster to a moneyless society that lives in harmony and zen, right? It's not going to happen. So uh, if you go onto my website, the ubuntuparty.org.za website, I've started posting a number of papers on how the transition will take place. There's not time for it now, so I ask you, please go onto our website and check it out. It's beautiful. What's key here is that the small towns will probably play a very important part in the transformation. Because in small towns and small communities, people will agree on things a lot quicker than in the big cities. Right? So they will agree, okay, we need to get off the grid. We need to grow enough food for all of us. We need to make sure we got water. And they can go out and do it. We must create alternative energy for ourselves in our town. So if the grid goes down, we stay alive. And the small towns and villages will become the activators of this transitional phase. And I put together a few theories and ideas to give people ideas how to start doing this. It also goes into, into our education and schooling systems, where we stop, stop sending your children to school. Please, I beg you, don't send your children to school. Don't do it. You're turning them into monsters. I've had in our few, few of my friends in Johannesburg in South Africa that have not sent their kids to school. They are much smarter than the kids that go to school. And I'm not kidding you. They really are. They just learn from their parents and they learn. And, and you'll find that, that what, often what happens with these kids, they start reading later. They might start reading a little bit later. But when they start reading, they become like these, they become like these monster little readers. They just read everything. I mean, these little kids are reading books that you know, other kids don't even dream of. And that's because they're not preconditioned by the schooling system. Energy, water, food, housing, arts and recreation. These are the things that small communities can take control of very, very quickly and establish it for themselves, make themselves go off the grid and be totally in control of their own destiny. And many, many community projects must be and should be attached to this activity. Absolute abundance on all levels. Once you start doing this, food, science, culture, community, abundance on all levels. Now I'm going to give you a small example. You've got to use your imagination here because there's not enough time now and we've got to finish off here. So imagine in the little town that I live, we've got a river, we've got a fish farm, we've got a dairy farm, we've got a bakery, we've got a wood, fa wood, wood factory, a metal factory. The community starts to work in these projects. The, the whole Ubuntu thing means that, and contribution means that everybody must contribute three hours a week towards one of these community projects. That's all you have to do, three hours a week. A little town of 1,000 people, it's 3,000 hours a week. No municipality or town council can afford 3,000 hours, 3, hours a week salaries for people to do this work. Can you see how that's dramatically shifted the status quo and the equilibrium? How much we can produce if we just work for 3 hours a week on basic projects, producing milk, cheese, butter, fish, breeding fish, 
uh, baking bread, planting, growing vegetables, and so forth. So now the community has been doing this for six months or a year, and they've established abundance on all levels. Where all the people in that community that participate, that's why I called it contributionism, that participate and add their t talent and their skills and their time, get everything, not for free, but virtually for free, so cheaply that the rest of the stuff, and also there's a principle where you, man, where, you, where you create three times as much as you need for your own community. And I structure everything in the, in the Ubuntu uh, philosophy on the sacred geometry principles, 3366. So you produce three times as much as you need for your community. Why? Because there'll be other communities that can't produce what you're doing, so you'll be actually helping them while they're helping you with the things that you can't produce. So, and by the end of that, there's so much abundance because you're doing it three times that Whatever you don't consume in your own little village or town, what are you going to do with? You're going to make it available on farmers markets and stores in your town for the surrounding communities. The moment you've achieved that state, you've created the domino effect. Because what's going to happen to all the neighboring towns? All the people from those towns are going to come buy your bread, your milk, your cheese, your whatever it is you produce. Because it's going to be a fraction of the cost they pay for it in their own town. There's your domino effect. There's your trigger point. So. Think about it from that perspective. At the, at the outset, it sounds like a huge thing. Wow, how are we going to go from there to a moneyless society? I believe that I've just taken you through a very simplistic examples, example of how small towns and small villages and communities can be the trigger points and the examples that start the domino effect. Once the first town is set up, it's impossible for the surrounding towns to stay alive. They will have to follow the same example. Otherwise, all their businesses will close down. And when they do close down, then they will follow your example. So either they will do it willingly or they'll be forced into it because of stupidity. In, in the Ubuntu communities, children follow their passion and their dreams. The education system changes completely. There are no classrooms. Children learn real practical skills. So by the age of 16, they've done everything. They've baked the bread. They've, they've worked in nuclear laboratories. They've built rockets. They've built homes. They've created... But they've created earth, built earth ships. They've planted seedlings and grown fruit. And they'll be so wise by the time you're 16 because you've had all this experience. You'll be smarter than all the professors in the world thrown together today. <laughs> so, <laughs> take, take any school lever today. Put them on a farm. Put them anywhere into a practical solution. What can a person with a high school diploma do today? Absolutely nothing. We're useless to society. That's what they've created. Can you see the brilliance in their plan? They are so smart, these people. They. <laughs> That's us, right? So we are so smart that we're doing this to ourselves, right? Where we create our children, turn our children into these little, we lock them up in jails for 12 years, most precious years of their life, and then throw them out to start all over again and, and be totally open to manipulation and control. So master teachers, only when a community decides that you're a master shoemaker or you're a master rocket scientist or you're a master baker or a master that only the community can decide who they will allow to teach their children. Isn't that a better system than teachers that go and get some diploma and they're real assholes and they teach your child? You go, God, how can that? I'm not going to let that teacher teach my child. The community will have the final say. So when I say decentralized government, that's how fine it becomes. The community chooses who their master teachers are, the people that they have respect for, and the people that they honor for their capacity and their ability. And this is how we grow, how we build Ubuntu communities, because only out of unity comes infinite diversity and abundance. Only out of unity. Anything else is a futile exercise that will bring us back to the same point at some future point in time. So I'm going to end here because this is the end. Join the Ubuntu Liberation Movement. It's not just a South African entity. We've had various people around the world say to us, can we start the same thing in, in wherever? Yes. Go online. Start the same thing. Use all the material I've published. Put it out there. Share it with everybody. And become part of this transitional phase. And uh, thank you for listening. I hope I gave you some food for thought.
The Venus Project is a veritable blueprint for the genesis of a new world civilization based on human concern and environmental reclamation. It proposes a holistic social design in which automation and technology would be intelligently integrated to maximize the quality of life rather than simply profits. Undesirable behaviors are products of long exposure to detrimental environments. If we wish to surpass the limitations of our present day society, such as war, hunger, poverty, and bigotry, we need to make changes and arrange society very differently. Most of our problems today are technical, but we still look for solutions through political means in a monetary system. We have the resources. Money is an interference because it limits our ability and it limits our dreams. Modern society has access to highly advanced technologies and can make available food, clothing, housing, medical care, a relevant educational system, and at the same time develop a limitless supply of renewable, clean energy such as geothermal, tidal, solar, wind, and more. The solutions lie in the intelligent and humane application of science and technology and more appropriate resource management in order to supply goods and services to everyone equitably, enabling the entire global population a very high standard of living. We don't have enough money to accomplish this, but we do have enough resources. If we initiate what Jacques Fresco calls a resource-based economy, this is where all goods and services are available to everyone without money, credit, barter, or servitude of any kind. For this to be attained, all resources must be declared as the common heritage of all the Earth's people. Imagine the possibilities of an unprecedented mobilization of scientific and technical alliances toward problem solving without the interference of money or politics to initiate global unification and restoration. The Venus Project would start with a systems approach to city design using highly effective construction methods emphasizing the conservation of resources. The first city would be a huge research center, making automated systems for the next city. It would be a place where we would disseminate information as to what sustainability really means for the future. The aim of the city is to constantly maximize existing and future technologies with the sole purpose of enhancing all human life and protecting the environment. The society I'm talking about is global cooperation, where all the nations work toward improving the lot of humankind. Now, why do that? Because the smarter people are, the richer and more secure everybody is. We have the tools at hand to design and build a future that is worthy of the human potential. It is imperative that we continue the process of social experimentation in order to transcend our present limitations and truly create the beginning of a civilized age.
down the south. Shut the door, keep down the south.
was shining and he knew he was a blade He didn't ever talk about he knew he couldn't wait Are you ever gonna push me up your own? Let me do it I need it and I'm ready and I haven't got a clue Any trick is turning up the races in my head I'm attacking the illusion that the stopping doesn't matter Time is running out and the illusion fades away Time is running out and all the days and it's raining Hello guys, this is a place where we do our reconnect with the earth program and you can see this beautiful nature feeling very inspired, empowered and fulfilled to be at this place and it's, I'm feeling alive so I invite you to be here on our first camp. Ethiopia is the best friend of India. He is 
In the TID program, Transformational Interactive Dialogue, I'm learning critical thinking skills and observation skills. So I become aware of my old thought patterns. In this program, we read real life stories. Reflecting on my early childhood when my parents divorced, I realized I had made two big decisions which were still influencing my life. One was that I am unlucky, two is nobody cares for me. When I did some critical thinking about this, I realized this disempowering belief system were not true and were not serving me. By seeing this previously unconscious belief system, I now have the choice to let it go and create something more empowering. The learning that I have got is challenging me to rise above my stories, to rise above my experiences, and to rise above my limitations. Anything 